Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel, an Arsenal special with an Arsenal legend. Ray Parler uh, is alongside me. Ray, absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks Brilliant for your time. Lovely to be here. See you. And what an exciting I'm season. I'm loving that tracksuit. It's well. proper old school oh, retro, isn't it? It's I wore that, those that badge back in the day. What, what year was that? That was probably a bit early 90s. So this was this was the badge when I was growing up, which would have been mid-90s. Yeah, mid-90s, sort of okay. Yeah, yeah. Top badge. Classics. Classics. Um, Ray, we're going to talk a little bit about Arsenal season in general because it has been an incredible season. Mm. We're recording this the day before uh, the game against Manchester City, so we don't know what the outcome of that is no. going to be yet, but I think there's still plenty to look, sort of unpack and to discuss. And um, you mentioned to me off air that you were with Arsenal in pre-season. Yeah. So I guess the first question, a good place to start is, did you foresee this coming in terms of Arsenal's upward trajectory? I certainly saw top four. I really believed that the, the team was showing a lot in training, especially in that pre-season area. We saw the game against Chelsea pre-season when they absolutely battered Chelsea. Could have been six or seven. Um, so there was good signs early, but you still got to go and do it in the Premier League game, which is totally different to pre-season. Um, I think Mikel Teta obviously got players out who he wanted out and he, and he bought players in who he wanted. Um, and he got well back, to be fair, by the board and whoever's buying the players they do has really helped him out. Um, so I was always optimistic before the start of the season, but I didn't expect them to be where they are uh, at this stage. You know, end of April, top of the league, got a massive game. Obviously, we're going to do this before the City game coming up. If they can get a result there, put some favourites to win the Premier League. So it's been a brilliant season, not just for for the fans. It's been a brilliant season for everybody involved in the club. Um, you know, from going down to the canteen ladies, who is a real buzz around the place, and and that's what it's all about. And I, I, certainly now, Arsenal are showing that getting back to the old ways under Arsene Wenger when I played and uh, that's great to see it really is you mentioned Edu and the support that he's shown Mikel Arteta obviously during difficult times as well at the start mm. of Mikel Arteta's tenure you know Edu personally you know you played with him you worked with him um, did you ever think that he'd become sort of a sporting director which is his official role well, a lot nowadays? of people say that did you expect him to be manager not really Steve Bowl, people like that um, but certainly Edu is, he knows his football uh, really top guy, really lovely guy. Him and Gilberto Silva come in at pr similar sort of times. Um, but the good thing about Edu, he played in good teams. He played in teams who won big trophies and um, he was involved in what you need to, to win a trophy. And he probably knows that and he's probably bringing that across to Mikel Arteta. But really nice guy. Every time I go to the training ground, he's always there and he comes and have a chat with me and you know we sit down and have lunch and whatever. So I'm really pleased for him, but he's doing a great job, by the way. I mean, he's he's always on his phone. I remember going pre-season, <laughs> at the start of the season, we were sitting around the pool. His phone didn't stop. You know, we talk about charge, charges on the phone. I don't know how many uh, battery charges he's got, but he was on his phone constant. So trying to get deals over the line. You, you can see the passion to try and get the right players in for Mikel Arteta, which, you know, really helps a manager out. And the players they did bring in have been superb absolutely brilliant I think it's interesting you say that because one of the things that was coming up in pre-season when you know fans were getting a little bit anxious about certain signings we'd hear of the interest and then it would be sometimes three or four weeks before mm. we actually got confirmation and fans would say well look Ed who's on holiday he's not but that, that it becomes a, myth, a lot of hard it? work mm. I mean transfers now are not as straightforward as they were when I was playing because there's all clauses and this and that everything's got to be right for both clubs and it does take time. But one thing about Edu, he targeted who he wanted and he really made um, the people who wanted to feel at home and, you know, be part of the family, if you like. Jesus probably was a little bit easier because he's Brazilian and he had the connection. Zinchenko was a big, big signing. Obviously, Mikel Arteta knows Zinchenko. Uh, that was a great signing and he put a lot of hard work into that one. Uh, and he's been a great signing for Arsenal as well. Odegaard obviously had the, the history of playing for Arsenal and it, that was pretty straightforward uh, after he was available. But, you know, it, it, you don't realise the hard work going in behind the scenes to get the right players in. You do miss some. There's no doubt about certain players you think, oh, well, we should have signed him, but he got out and someone else bought him. But it's, it's very competitive. But one thing about Edu is, you know, He's detailed to try and get the right player. You know, he go knock people's door, and you know, yeah, he, yeah. a little bit like David Dean back in the day. You know, he was fly to Brazil to try and get Gilberto Silva, and you know, it'd been constant. In 
in the end, the player goes right. I'll sign. That's it. Uh, you know. So I think Edu's very similar to David Dean. He really he, he targets who he wants, and he really goes to work to make sure they are coming to the right club and they will be at home and they will settle in straight away. And and that's what he's done a great job of doing. Arsenal massively missed David Dean for they years. They do, of course. So they to have do. someone of that ilk, yeah, not exactly the same, but to have someone of that ilk is obviously helpful. And a, a fantastic player as well. We do. I mean, he. he uh, he plays some great games alongside me sometimes in central midfield. But yeah, exactly right. David Dean was a big, big part of Arsenal Football Club, uh, bringing in likes of Dennis Bergkamp, obviously working very hard with Arsene Wenger at the time. And when he left, that was a little bit of a hole for Arsenal to fill. Uh, but I think they've certainly got the right man now in Edu. And they've got a good relationship together. They know what angle the club wants to go in. And I think the, the the owners now know that they've got the right people in charge and they will back them as much as they can. Um, and, and that's only good for Arsenal Football Club going forward. Have you had much contact with the ownership? Because obviously when the Super League thing came about, there was a lot of negativity towards them. A lot them. of bad mistakes every now and mm. again. We, I think a lot of clubs made that mistake, didn't they, with the Super League? You know, they, they weren't thinking of the fans. They are looking at the financial side of it. But I, I, I think that's gone now. Will it, whether it come back again, we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, I do, I've, when I go pre-season, we go out with Josh, obviously, uh, Kwonke, the, uh, the son. And he's a really good guy. He want, he's trying to do the best he can for his, his, his dad and, and whatever. Um, but you can see that he, he loves Arsenal Football Club. He wants to do the best for Arsenal Football Club. Um, and whenever he's done press conferences, he's, he's always come out the, the right words to the Arsenal fans. So you've got to trust him. You've got to, you know, and, and, and say he has put the money where he's, made, you know, where where he said he's going to do. Yeah. We're buying players, certain players, and uh, hopefully, if we can somehow win this title this year, it'd be a remarkable turnaround. From uh, and as I said before, this would be a bigger. Just as a big achievement as me winning two doubles and the Invincibles because there's big outsiders at the start of the season and no one give them a chance to, to win the league. But, you know, still a long way to go yet though. You mentioned that you've been on a few pre-season tours with the club. What's changed in your opinion? You mentioned intensity and all that stuff. I think the journey more, yeah. the journey to where they go. <laughs> I mean, we was always going Austria, um, usually Europe. Very rarely we went to Asia or America. Um, obviously money talks now and pre-season it's great to get around the world because you don't realise how big the Premier League is you don't realise how big Arsenal is Manchester United Liverpool Chelsea you know all these big sides going around the world what it does for the fans as well because a lot of fans in America or Asia they can't get to uh, the Emirates let's say and watch a live game but suddenly they, they've got an opportunity to see the players in the flesh and they love it they absolutely love it so uh, it's great that I can get on the tours and, and, and whatever, but I think it's a little bit different from my era. You know, you you, you play games. Um, we didn't really rarely play games against Chelsea or you know, United. You're playing uh, Charity Shield. That would be the only game you really played against one of your rivals. But now they seem to play, you know, Spurs. They might play Arsenal, play Spurs in, in Asia or Arsenal play Manchester United in America. And, that, and that's the probably difference between... Uh, our era and probably their era. Yeah, definitely. There's that kind of commercial element to it. Uh, you want to put on a show for those fans to come out in force and, and to be fair, they do. And you want more supporters. You, 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 your fan base around the world is always growing um, and that's why it's so important that you're successful or you, you're competing. I'm sure lots of uh, young Arsenal fans who've just started to support the club around the world are really enjoying this season and hopefully we can get a few more supporters around the world because they're they're very important as well. You must have spent time around the club during Unai Emery's tenure and obviously now Mikel Arteta has taken over. What What is different looking? So I know you're not there every day, no. but sort of being there from time to time, what have you noticed in terms of the mood around the place and the, the general sort of demeanour of the players? Well, certainly togetherness was very important and um, obviously Arteta had, to, had a couple of big jobs to to feel, I mean, getting rid of certain players, and it's always difficult to get rid of players when they're on good contracts. When they, you know, if they're not playing, they can sometimes upset the other guys in the dressing room. If they're quite big players, so he had a, he had a problem with that. So I was, I was very impressed with how he dealt with that at times. Uh, under Emery, I just I've, I've, I felt like he overcomplicated it a little bit too much. Um, you know, sometimes you can you can do too much tactical stuff. 
where football is a simple game. You do your jobs as your position. You learn your job in your position and, and you get get on with it. And it looks like Arteta has done that. He, everybody knows what sort of role they play. You know, Zinchenko coming into midfield at times. And, you know, it's amazing to watch now because in my era, you would never see a left back moving into central midfield like Nigel Whitnerburn, Ashley Cole, who I played with. What are you doing, you know? And But that's the way they've evolved and footballers evolved probably. And you try and see, you know, Liverpool started to do it now. Trent Alexander-Arnold moving into midfield. You had Man City always do it, obviously. That's where Zinchenko learned it from, probably. Um, but it's amazing to see how it all works. And that's, that's, that's where all the hard work is done, though, is on that training field. Training field is the most important part for any player. Um, Saturdays is important, of course. You're walking out the stadium in front of the fans. That's when you've got to uh, perform. But you've got, to know what you, you, you've got to know what to do on a Saturday before you get there. And that's where the Monday to Friday comes in on that training field. And that's where Wenger was so good. You know, on a Saturday before a game, he let you get on with it. Right, it's down to you now. You know your job for the team. If you don't do your job, it's down to you. And and that, and that's, that's why we were so successful, I think, because everybody knew exactly what their role was in the team. And I think Mikel Arteta now has done that very, very similar to the team now. That Everybody knows their role, what they're playing. And... You know, Xhaka, look at Xhaka, who would have thought he would have been more advanced and playing the way he is now? And and that is good management for me because now you're getting the best out of Xhaka. Probably you didn't get the best out of him when he was playing that parte role because yeah. he's not mobile enough. But now, because he's good on the ball and he can make things happen, that they pushed him a little bit further forward. So there's little, you know, where you can change, slightly change things that can really m- make a big difference in a game. And that's what Arteta's done so well. Togetherness is, is obviously a huge thing. It's, it's massive. And, and I think in football, it probably helps you get over the line in certain situations. Absolutely, where, yeah. You know, you ordinarily... It's like being in the trenches, you know, yeah. in a war. If you, you've always you always got to be working together. Um, and how do you get over that line? How do you, you know... And if you've got people alongside you, you respect and... You know, you don't have to always like people, but as long as you respect them, and you know what your, your jobs are, and, and everybody does their jobs, then that's that's a massive bonus. If you've got people who are not going your way, they're going that way, and you're always going that way, it doesn't work. I promise yeah. you now, especially in the dressing room area, because you're with each other for long periods during the week, and you've got to get on. You've got to enjoy people's company. You got to. That's why we used to have a laugh off, off it, you know, after training, we were mucking about, and and that's what it is. You get people's characters as well. You learn people's characters because everyone's different in football. Uh, but it's, it's how to get the best out of the characters. And um, I think they've got that now. I, I look at the camaraderie and, you know, when, when things are going against them, they stick together. And that is so important in the football team, really is. Any level, not, yeah. just, not just Premier League, any level. I mean, I don't like to make the comparison between this team and the Invincibles because I don't think this team have earned the right to be no. spoken about yet in that regard. They might one day, but they're not there yet. Uh, because they haven't achieved what you guys achieved or, or anything mm. close. But I, I think back to that incident at Old Trafford, the one involving Rude Van Nistelrooy. Yep. And a lot of people sort of came out off the back of that. It cost me a few quid, that did. Yeah, I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody sort of condemned Arsenal's behaviour that day. And I remember as a, as a young Arsenal fan watching that game and thinking, yeah, OK, it's not ideal. But that showed a togetherness. And mm. sometimes you have to have that edge and you have to say, yeah. we're not going to be intimidating. And I thought Arsenal really sent Man a United were very there. similar to mm. us. I mean, that's why it's such a feisty game because you get two teams that are desperate to win and um, have got winning mentality. That's what sort of game you're going to get. You know, and if one, one split second, it can change. Um, and you can look over the years, obviously we had that little bit of luck that day when Van Nistelrooy misses a penalty. And if a lot of it was a little bit of relief that he did miss a penalty because we knew that if you can get four points in the two um, games against Manchester United, you've got half a chance of winning the league that year or a good chance of winning the league. So it was more relief than anything, especially Martin because he gave away the penalty. Mm. Um, but when you look at it back at 99 semi-final, you know, Ryan Giggs scores that one the goal, but we have a penalty last kick of the game. You know, Dennis Bergkamp sticks a penalty away. We were in the final. And we might go on to win a double again. So that's how close it was between both sets of uh, players. Uh, and you want to see that a little bit. You want to see that desire. You want to see that little, you know, every now and again, have a little bit of a scrap. And, and people sticking up for each other. And, and that's, that's, that's all down to having good team spirit and everyone helping each other. People used to look at that and, and say, you know, two teams that are trying to compete at the highest level and it's competitiveness. Was there genuine hatred 
between those two? Cause no, I think there was respect. Uh, there's, there's no there's no doubt we was desperate to beat Manchester United and I'm sure United were desperate to beat us. But at the end of the day, I, I, that, that, that was the only real game that got out of hand. We, we, you can go back to Patrick Vieira in the tunnel with Roy Keane and, you know, so you could see the friction between both sets of players. But I think at the end of it, there, there was all winners. Both sets of teams have, have, have been so successful um, and that's why the friction was there, which was, I think it's great for football, I really do. I mean, any neutral, I'm sure if Arsenal Man United were playing in that sort of era, they would say, so let's yeah. make sure we watch this because we know that it's going to be really tense and we know it could go either way um, and a couple of bad mistakes from either side and, and they lose the game. So, um, but I would say there's hatred. I think there was respect, but we was desperate to beat them and they was desperate to beat us and that's why it was so, sometimes it overboiled. As a, yeah. as a game and um, and that's why it got out of hand sometimes and you had, a, you had to have a strong referee put it that way yeah definitely and after the game you know, I go in you've got ice packs everywhere but you've been kicked and they'd be the same they've been kicked as well so uh, lots of good players on both teams and um, re- really I want to call every single week if you played each other every week yeah fine margins indeed. yeah absolutely um, bringing it back to the present day I, you can't get away with half the stuff that you did back then no. now um, football is very very different but we do see that edge sometimes from this Arsenal side and that gives me encouragement as a fan watching on. Mm. Is it nice to see that fire back at Arsenal? Because it did feel like it kind of went out for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important in, in teams. I, I think sometimes the the crowd get a lift from that. It's not it's not always about goals. It's not always about... We can go back to the Liverpool game when Jacko Trent Alexander-Arnold, you know, suddenly he's reacted. The Liverpool fans got a lift out of that. So... That's what you want to see sometimes. Sometimes just a, a real good tackle can get the crowd going and, and get the players around you going as well. Um, and I've seen that this season. You know, I've seen a desire from the players and I think the connection has grown with the, the fans this season, uh, which is so important. You know, you've got to get the fans behind you. And all the fans want to do, I'm a fan now. I, I'm, I go to the Emirates and I, I'm, I'm willing and Arsenal to win every single game. All I want to see is a bit of commitment because I've been there. I, you can have a bad game. There's, that's excusable, but I don't. There's no, there's no. You, you can't get excused by not showing the commitment, uh, and that's what I think they've shown this year. Really, in bundles of games that I've watched, that sometimes they haven't played great, but the commitment's been there, and I, th- I think the fans respect that, and that's why they've been so so behind them this season. Yeah, absolutely, couldn't agree more. I think no. that the atmosphere within the stadium has just improved, and it's so, so important as well. That yeah. that. The players get a massive lift from that. I promise you now. We couldn't wait. At certain games, especially in '98, when we started going on that big run where we had won ten in a row, you know, it's a little bit different because the coach goes or the bus used to go underneath now, doesn't it? The Emirates, yeah, but yeah. we used to park right outside the marble halls, and it's amazing to see when you're successful and you started winning games. How many people? Suddenly, there's another hundred this week. And there's another two hundred. In, in the end, the old Avenal Road was packed with supporters. And that just us getting off that coach and walking up the, the stairs and getting a massive roar from the crowd, that give you, oh, right, lads, come on, this is, you know, that give you a massive buzz to get out on that pitch and do even better. So I think the, I think the team now have certainly uh, benefited from the crowd this season, just the buzz they get from uh, how, how, how the crowd are reacting to them. We've seen the club take a more active approach recently in terms of bringing back former players having them around the place. I know that Sol Campbell was at the training ground the other day. Um, I know that you've been there. Well, David Seaman goes probably David once Seaman, a week, yep. yeah. So th- that's, for me, that's something that stopped happening at the end of Arsene Wenger's time. Hmm. How important do you think it is for the, the players of today to know that there is a massive history at this club and that the legends, if you like, are around them and supporting them? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's massive. I mean, you go to home games now, you've got Thierry's usually in the crowd. And Patrick... Although every time Thierry comes, we don't seem to win. So, uh, <laughs> Obviously, Patrick is there a lot more often now. And now he's at not a Crystal Palace. And it's great to see the old boys. You know, people are like, I sit next to Charlie George when I go. And look at Charlie, 1971, that's famous FA Cup final goal. And it's great to see. You can see his passion as well. I mean... He kicks every ball still, Charlie. I mean, it's great to see that, you know, he's willing the team on as well. And we're all, we are all behind the team now. I mean, it's not one ex-Arsenal player saying, well, yeah, no, we were better. No, we're all supportive and to say, come on, lads. What a what a great season it'd be if you can somehow win that title. Because as I said before, we was always probably one of the favourites to win it. 
um, every single season. Arsenal this season were probably four favourites, fifth favourites to win it. So it's amazing to see the turnaround, and uh, we're just willing them on. And and it must be they must be. You know, I, I get a lot of respect when I go to his pre-season. All the lads come up to me, Odegaard, oh, hey, what was it like in your era? And it's great to talk about what we did because if it helps them a little bit, a couple of percent, then it helps them. And uh, that is the most important thing for, for the ex-players to try and help the team now. How have you found the sort of move from obviously being a player, now you're a supporter, but you're also a pundit mm. and you work on a lot of big platforms. And one of the things that I think... Arsenal fans have grown a little bit frustrated with over recent years. I've certainly felt this way towards certain ex-players. Yeah. Is that it feels like, or it felt like in the last few years, I know things weren't great, but that some people were ready and waiting to stick the boot in. Mm. Do you think about the impact of what you say about Arsenal before you speak um, about it? Sometimes the game, you, the game doesn't lie, does it? I mean, say, say what you see. There'll be times when Arsenal have been poor and the commitment's not there, but... It's no good sitting on the fence and saying, oh, well, no, it's, I don't like hammering players if mm. I can help it because I've been in the same situation. As long as they're showing their little bit of you know, energy and, and whatever, and everybody has bad games, you can't, you can't odds that. Um, if it probably happens more than often, you don't get a chance to say anything anyway because usually they get changed and they get dropped, which usually what managers should be doing if you're not playing that well. Um, but I, I just think that you've got to, as long as I see a little bit of passion, a little bit of commitment, you know, putting that shirt on is a very important, as Pat Rice used to tell me as a youth team player, you know, you've got to be, you, it's a privilege to wear that shirt and you go out and give everything. And that's all you want to see if, if I'm a supporter. If I see people being lazy and not doing the work right, and that would, that would probably be more of a, a thing where I can't handle. You know, I don't mind people having bad games, but as long as they show that commitment for by wearing a shirt. And I think every single player's done that this season. Yeah. Not played brilliant every game. It's impossible. But they've shown that they, they've got the desire, they've got the commitment to try and turn it around or do something to turn it around if, if it is going wrong for, for Arsenal. Yeah, and, and obviously just kind of sticking on the punditry theme, um, social media has changed the landscape. You can say one line and it can catch fire and yeah. go everywhere. Is that something that plays on your mind as well? Uh, not really. I, know, I mean, again, I, you don't get too involved in it, really. I mean, if I was a player now, I'd probably be very... I'd, I'd probably be careful about it, to watch it. Now, the only reason I say that is that characters... Everyone is different as a character. Yeah. I'm a pretty strong-minded character, so if I saw... I know when I've had a bad game. I know when I've made a mistake. I, I know exactly when it, things have gone wrong in your personal situation. I don't need another million, two million people to tell me that as well. So I'd be very careful, but certain characters might be a little bit more weaker and it affects their game. It mm. might affect their confidence. It might affect you know, their belief going forward. So I'd be very, if I was a manager now, I'd, I'd target different players who may be a little bit weaker than others to say, you be careful with that because it can affect you going forward. But um, I love it as well because... It's a communication between fans and players or whoever it's going to be that, that that wasn't around years ago, was it? And you couldn't communicate with people. And there's some, some, some there's so much good in social media and certain platforms, but there's also that little small percentage of really being bad. You know, yep. people doing, having a gut people for the sake of it, which, you know, that's what you don't want to see, you know. And there's a lot of, with, with their health and, you know, this, these days, it can affect people. Yeah. And, and that is totally unacceptable and, and that's, that's that's where the wrong is in social media and platforms and whatever but there's probably a lot more good than it is bad 100% it's mm. just the bad seems to stick out yeah and, absolutely um, it's always the loud minority it feels like anyway um, in terms of the team this season it's been as you say whatever happens now it's mm. been a remarkable season for Arsenal um, we know what Mikel Arteta's starting 11 is today you know, if everybody's fit, we know that it's Ramsdale, Zinchenko, yeah. Gabriel Saliba, White, Partey, Xhaka, Odegaard, and then probably uh, Martinelli, Saka, and Jesus through the yes. middle. Going into the summer, is there any area in that starting eleven that you look at? And I'm not saying that there's players in there that are bad. I think I'm pretty happy with that starting yeah. eleven. But going into the summer, if you were in Mikel Arteta in Edu's position, where would you be looking to potentially either add 
better players or add strength in depth? Well, certainly, I think the midfield. I, I think Georgina was a good signing because he's, you know, he's a, he's a guy that's very experienced. Um, he knew he was going to come in second fiddle. He, he was yeah. he was going to get a few opportunities here and there, but he knew Partey was the right man. Obviously, Declan Rice has been mentioned quite quite often, and I, I think he'd be a great signing because he's done a great job in a West Ham team that's struggling a little bit, you know, defensively. He might get a little bit more licence to go forward, which he's a good footballer as well, Declan. People don't see that. They maybe score a few more goals. Um, certainly striker-wise, I think that's the my most important part of, you know, scoring goals. We've always had top-class strikers. I mean, I'll go back to my era again. We had four top strikers, Carnu, Will Tord, Omri and Burkamp. Now probably you got, Eddie's done a great job when uh, Jesus has been out, but I know they play a little bit of a different role now. We're playing one up front, and we sometimes. But Dennis was probably the one who dropped in behind yeah. in my in my era. So I think they might look at another striker. Um, I think strikers are so hard to come by. They're top quality ones, but I'm sure Edu is working very hard. I think Saliba's been a, a great partnership with Gabriel, so you want to try and stick with that. He's a young lad as well. He's only 22, Saliba, so he's got a lot, a lot of time in front of him. Um, right back, I think Ben White's done a magnificent job. You've got Tammy Yasu there as well. Left back, you're pretty pretty good. Sinchenko, Tierney. So there's not a lot, a lot, of, lot of space. He's got Smith Rowe to come back in on, on the left-hand side if you needed. Uh, Martin Ellis took his chance while he's been injured. Um, so for me it would be more central midfield Declan Rice has been mentioned heavily uh, and probably a centre forward and that's that's a big chunk of money gone as yeah, well uh, and maybe a few go out on loan or leave and, and whatever but I think they're, they're the most two important places for me in the summer How do you think Arsenal will cope with Champions League football next season because I mean I think it's fair to say that we've, we've qualified for the Champions League mm. it's not done mathematically but yeah. you know it, it, we're pretty much there but what's going to change for Arsenal is, and I know people talk about the Thursday and Sunday in the Europa being quite difficult, but what you now have is a situation in the Champions League where you can't rest half of your team on the no. Thursday and get away with it. So how big a change is that going to be for the players? Well, it's a young team, isn't it? I mean, you should be able to handle two or three games a week. Yeah, I couldn't wait to play football. All what happens really when there's a lot more congestion in fixtures and playing games is you train a little bit less. You know, and your training is 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 a game go out and play the game sort of thing. So, um, and that's where you got to manage people. You know, warm down. Arsenal men was very good with like recoveries after after games. And but when you're a young young man, 23, 24, 25, which we're very lucky to have a very young squad of players, you can't wait for the next game, especially if you're successful. And you should your your body should be able to earn, handle that workload. Differently, if you're 29 and you're getting into thirties totally different and you look at Manchester City you know De Bruyne and people like that they're, they're getting they're 31s and they seem to be able to play uh, every single game and put a good quality performance in so I think you've got to um, manage manage your body well and which they do now they look after each other and look after themselves sorry uh, and they know exactly how to approach a game and, and, and whatever and when you're winning football matches you can't wait for the next game it's when you start losing When's the next game? We need to win this one. And it gets, becomes a little bit harder. So let's hope they're successful um, next season and they can't wait for the next Champions League game. And it'd be interesting to see how they do, I must admit. You're playing against the best teams in Europe now. As much as Europa League, it's great to be in Europe. But now you're in a, the elite competition to see how they can challenge and, and try and compete, really. And I'm sure they can, this team. Just a few quick, uh, quick fire questions for you before we wrap up. Um, Who's been the most improved player for you this season? Uh, most improved player? Um, do you know, I, I, I really love... Look, we all know Saka's a great, great player and Martinelli's been excellent. I've really enjoyed watching Odegaard this year. I think he's been so good. I mean, to get the captain's armband as well, that shows that he's in training, he's, he's, his application is right every day in training. People respect him because you don't get the armband for nothing. Um, and I love the way he plays. I really do. He always wants the ball. He gets out of tricky little situations. He loves football. And I've met him on a, quite a few occasions. He's such a great guy. You know, the way he just comes up and says, oh, how are you doing, Ray? And he, he talks about our era winning trophies and oh, hopefully we can win trophies. So he's, he's, he's a really good guy as well. So for me, Odegaard has really stepped up, been mm. skipper as well, and he's never injured. He, he wants to play every minute of every game. So 
Uh, for me, he's been excellent. But I could probably single out so many people who's been brilliant this year. You can go right across the board. Saliba, Gabriel, Zinchenko. Ben White's done a brilliant job. Partey's been excellent in midfield. Xhaka's. So you could pick out. But if I had to pick one, probably Odegaard would be, be the one. Who's been your surprise package this season? As in, who's performed at a level that you maybe thought was beyond them? Um, do you know what? I think Ben White. I think Ben White, he got pushed out to that right back situation because probably of injuries. And he's done such a good job. He really has. I mean, as, as a, as a centre-half, it's not easy. And he's got forward when he's had to. He's not been as dynamic as probably Tierney or Zinchenko on the left-hand side. But he supported Saka very well. And he's been excellent by doing what he's done. But he's be, also been a great defender. When you've got someone who's bombing on, you need... Sometimes they've moved across and he can play that little bit alongside as a three at the back. Mm. So for me, he's, he'd not surprise me because, you know, for £50 million, pound, you knew you, you was getting a good player. But his, his versatility, he's, he's been brilliant for Arsenal. And he's, he's proved that he can play right back and he can play centre-half. And um, I think he's been excellent. I really do. And the final one, season's over. Player of the season awards. It's up to Ray Parler. Who, who well, are you singling out? Yeah, it's still a long way to go. Like, like, you know, we've got another seven, eight games and someone could become a real big hero um, in the last seven games. But probably up to now, as much as uh, Odegaard's been brilliant, I think Saka's got to get it. I mean, the goals he scored from the right-hand side, some of the performances have been excellent. And uh, he's a really good guy, isn't he? He's a great young lad. He's always smiling. And he's, you know, he's had a lot of things happen in, the, in his career at a young age. You know, Missing penalties in the European Championship for England, Harry responded to that, and you know that she shows you that he's a well-grounded kid, and he he can get better and better, and I'm sure most clubs around the world would love him, would love him in the, in their side. So probably Saka at the moment would be the one, but I'm gonna say if someone can somehow you know get a hat trick against Man City and <laughs> go on to Jesus and. They could, could come a hero straight away if they can win the league somehow. They can take it away from you. <laughs> uh, Ray, thank you so much. Uh, absolute pleasure. pleasure having you on. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Leave a like on the video as well. Uh, thank you all so much. We'll be back soon with more.